the other hand, we have two uh, kind of funny looking orbitals. Uh, one of which we have right here, which is the dz squared. So dz squared looks quite strange. Uh, this is the one that looks much different than any others do because it looks like a sort of a barbell with a ring around the center. In this case, we can notice something very, very important. We notice that the lobe of the orbital points directly towards the ligand. This one points directly towards the ligand. And then this ring here points directly towards these two ligands here. So we see that with this particular orbital, dz squared, that we maximize the electrostatic repulsion between the ligands and the electrons in the orbital. So this tends to push the orbital up in energy. So we see that this dz squared orbital uh, gets pushed up in energy relative to the T2G set that we had just talked about. So uh, this one, another orbital which also falls into the same category is the dx squared minus y squared orbital. So that also has a situation where the lobes point directly towards the ligands. Because of that, dz squared and dx squared minus y squared are pushed up in energy relative to the T2Gs. They form a group of two doubly degenerate states, which we label EG or EG star. E is because it's doubly degenerate. The G tells us that the orbitals are garata, which they are because they're d orbitals. Later on, you'll see that they are also the EG star because they are antibonding. A relative to, there's also a bonding EG set that uh, we'll talk about somewhat later on. But so we were able to break the d orbitals into two sets for the octahedral case. The lower energy are the T2Gs. That's DXY, DXZ, and DYZ. And a higher energy set of two, the EG stars, <laughs> which are DZ squared and DX squared minus Y squared. As far as the symmetry operations of the octahedron, let's first take a look at the mirror planes. For the octahedron, there are two different types of mirrors. There is a horizontal mirror and a dihedral mirror. So we have built models to demonstrate both of these types. So first, let's look at our octahedron, kind of squeeze it together here. So it looks like our traditional octahedron, but we can open it up along this particular plane here and see that if we slice the octahedron along this particular plane, we can open it up and we see that it cuts out a sort of square region. So this is the horizontal mirror. So we can see it this way. The horizontal mirror goes right along that particular plane. We'll see later on that it actually is a horizontal mirror because it's going to be perpendicular, perpendicular to the high order rotation axis, which is going to come out directly this way towards the camera. So perpendicular to the plane of this square is a C4 axis. We'll see that later on. That's our, that's our high order proper rotational axis. But until then, this is the horizontal mirror. So now one thing which is not immediately clear when we're looking at an octahedron and very important to keep in mind is that all six positions of the octahedron are exactly equivalent. So even though we often hold the octahedron in such a way as we have a top, a bottom, and sort of four atoms along the waist. That's one way to look at the octahedron. It's not the only way. And in fact, we can uh, rotate it a number of different ways and demonstrate that each of the atoms is I entirely identical. So anyway, but this is one way to demonstrate where the horizontal mirror plane is. We could also hold the, the octahedron in kind of a, a non-traditional sort of way. Kind of looks like the ordinary octahedron, but now we show that the mirror plane will go this way. So, so we don't necessarily have to hold it so that it's horizontal to the floor. There are a number of these mirror planes that are all equivalent to each other. And this is the horizontal mirror. To demonstrate this even better, we can make additional models. But in this case, we can make a model where we color the region. So it almost looks like we've opened up 
the inside of a uh, of a musk melon or something here. So the this is the inside, and the orange shows exactly where the horizontal mirror plane can be found, at least one of them. So see one at a time for a particular octahedral model. The octahedron also has a second type of mirror plane. In this case, the mirror plane goes between sets of atoms. So it goes through an atom at the top, an atom at the bottom, and an atom in the center, but it goes between these two atoms on both sides. Since it goes between the largest number of atoms, we call this a dihedral mirror. And we build a model to actually demonstrate what this looks like. So you can actually open up the model. So let's turn around this side where the opening is. There we go. You can open it up and we can actually see where the mirror plane is. Welcome to my mirror plane. So it even tells you, a very nice octahedron will actually even tell you where its own symmetry operations are. Is that a, is that a figure or what? Okay. So we're able to build and then we can see from this side, if we print it out, there'll be a line from the uh, uh, inkjet printer and kind of turn it around this way. We can even see, even see that the dihedral mirror is labeled as sigma d. So one of the advantages of being able to print out the patterns for the, mo for the models using an inkjet printer is that it's possible to print directly onto the paper that you're going to cut out and you can put a large number of additional labels to help better demonstrate both where the symmetry operations are and how they relate to uh, our chemical understanding of the system. So this is, again, we'll show one more time. This is the dihedral mirror. So for the, turn it upside down. So for the octahedron, we have both horizontal and dihedral mirrors. Here's the dihedral mirror. And for comparison, we can go back and show here is the horizontal mirror. So the horizontal mirror is set up differently than the dihedral mirror. The octahedron has a very large number of important rotational axes. Let's kind of slide this up this way. There we go. Kind of center it there. So if we look down this particular angle, it's very easy to, to demonstrate a C4 axis. So we built a model so that we can actually rotate like we did before. We can actually rotate by a C4. We can actually do a 90 degree rotation of our octahedron. And we see that it looks exactly like it did before. Again, we can rotate it one more time. So this is C4 squared, which is also the equivalent of a C2 operation in this direction. Again, we can go clockwise, and we see that everything lines up. This tells us that C4 to the minus 1 is a symmetry operation of the octahedron, and we can do it again. So we have C4 minus 2, which is equivalent to uh, C2 minus 1. So it tells us that we have both C4 and C2 axes, uh, and these are uh, perpendicular to the horizontal mirrors. So that proves that um, our assignment of the one type of mirror to be a horizontal mirror was actually correct. So if we look down this particular axis, we can see the C4 rotation of the octahedron very clearly. If we arrange our octahedron like this, it makes it much easier to see that we have, in addition to the C4 axis, we also have a C3 axis. So one way to demonstrate that is to actually just put an axle right through the through the hole there. So this will help demonstrate our C3 axis. So try to hold it like that. We notice that if we rotate by a third, by a C3 operation, we're back exactly where we started from. And we can do that again. Rotate another one one more time. So C3 squared is a symmetry operation. If we go in the opposite direction, we go clockwise, we see that C3 minus 1 is also a symmetry operation of the octahedron and the octahedral point group OH. So for many purposes, it's very useful to be able to draw 
the octahedron in this presentation looking down the C3 axis because um, some of the symmetries of substituted octahedra are much easier to pick up in this presentation than in some of the more conventional presentations. Another way to demonstrate this for students if you don't like to use axles and you want to be more colorful is we can actually use a very colorful pipe cleaner. Let me put the pipe cleaner through there. There we go, nice and purple. And so we can see, let me bend this so it's not too long. We have our, we have our axis and we can rotate along that. So that's our C3 axis. So we're, we're not sure where that is. Our students are not sure where that is. We can actually put a pipe cleaner directly through it. And by rotation, we can see that it repeats. And that is, that's a C3 axis. That is one of the more difficult axes for students to identify and to picture mentally where that comes in. 